Good morning, everybody. I'd like to get started. Um, just wanted to make a, 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 just a few comments before introducing uh, Dean Alpern, our speaker today. Uh, the first is to remind everybody that the Doximity polling is open and to remind you that uh, uh, I guess you get an invitation to vote. Uh, please, if you get that invitation, uh, uh, take the time to vote. Uh, the voting that you can do there is for the psychiatric hospital, for Yen Haven Psychiatric Hospital. That's the only way U.S. News and World Report ranks the Department of Psychiatry. So remember, everybody in the department should, should come out to support Yen Haven Psychiatric Hospital in the polling. You forgot to remind them that this is the best hospital in the country. And this is the best <laughs> hospital in the country. I, I assumed you knew, I assumed that you all you knew that. Goes without saying, right? Uh, second thing is that uh, uh, we will uh, shortly uh, uh, be sending around an invitation to uh, write your uh, legislators related to the governor's uh, proposed cuts to the mental health budget. Um, we want to make sure, what, what's taking us a little time is we want to make sure that we get concentrated letter writing, in other words, at least 10 or more people to each legislator that we target in order to convey the seriousness and impact of, uh, uh, of our concern about the threatened cuts to uh, DMIS and CMHC budgets. Uh, in terms of upcoming grand rounds is uh, in two weeks, uh, one of our department alumni, Steve Keynes, who's the chief medical officer of Sage Pharmaceuticals, is going to come. Some of you may know that Sage just got uh, FDA approval for a novel antidepressant medication based on, uh, uh, it's a neurosteroid compound, very new and interesting, uh, and uh, it'll be fun to have uh, an alumnus of our department back who's uh, made good uh, to uh, talk to us about this very new interest, interesting new treatment. So without further ado, let me introduce Dean Alpern, a uh, friend and supporter of the department, and, uh, and your dean, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks John. The, uh, okay, so I'm going to tell you about the state of the school. And I, I think to quote, uh, is it Donald Trump, the state of the school is good. <laughs> the, uh, so, um, So things are changing in the dean's office uh, a lot, and I, I think in, in many good ways. Um, we were obviously very sad to lose Carolyn last year, but it caused us to take an internal look at the dean's office and to look at what we were delivering. And what we realized is that Carolyn was in that position for decades, and during that time the school grow, grew like three or fourfold. And uh, we were probably the only medical school in the country that had one person doing faculty affairs and scientific affairs. Um, and so what we decided to do is, is we now have Linda Bachenstedt as the deputy dean for faculty affairs. And th that really is a, a huge job, and there's so much to do, it. and she's, she's getting a lot done. Um, you know, and I'll just use one example. I don't know how many of you have been involved in the allotment process, but you know, 30 years ago, Yale controlled the number of slots and the allotment process made sense. It hasn't made sense for about two decades, and we've still gone through it every year. And so Linda got in this position and said, why are we doing this allotment process? And we spoke to the provost's office, and he couldn't answer it, and we killed it. So, so that we've eliminated this whole bureaucratic committee and process that made no sense. And this is what happens when one person can focus on it. We also realized that in scientific affairs that uh, the, you know, the 150 basic science faculty were, were getting a, a lot of attention, but that the massive size of the clinical departments, that there really uh, wasn't possible for one person to, to really pay attention to the clinical departments. 
So we ha now have two deputy deans for scientific affairs, one for basic science departments, one for clinical departments. And uh, th this sends a message, but I think it's real, because I think people were concerned that you know the clinical department's deputy dean was Paul Tahiri, and that nobody was really assigned to academic scientific affairs in clinical departments. And the dean's office really didn't care about that; just wanted the clinicians to generate revenue, and that's not true. And the majority of our grants are in the clinical departments, and and a lot of great science comes in our clinical departments. And so so now Brian Smith is going to be. Uh, focusing just on clinical departments, my career on basic science departments. One of the negatives of this, everybody said, is, well, you know, science bridges between these groups. Well, their offices are right across from each other. They meet. If you go to either one of them, you're going to both of them. They talk continuously. And, and it's working really well. Um, and still, I have to say, the clinical departments are still so massive that um, it, it, it's still a challenge, but uh, Brian will focus on that. And Brian's a physician scientist, and so he understands it. We've uh, also, uh, a year ago, Darren came as the chief diversity officer, um, and uh, you know, he said to me, do you think this is an important job? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, then why isn't it a deputy dean position? <laughs> So that day he became the deputy dean <laughs> for uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, and uh, those of you who have worked with Darren, he is wonderful. And frankly, I should have done this 10 years ago. The, there's so many issues related to diversity and inclusion, and there's just no way that a dean can pay the attention to it that it deserves. And, so, and, and Darren is just incredibly good at it. So the other thing I'm just happy to tell you, the easiest endowed chair I have ever raised was an endowed chair in Carolyn's name. Carolyn worked with many of our donors, and uh, literally in two days, we called a, a number of the donors who had worked with her and raised $3 million for an endowed chair. Um, so uh, this chair is going to, because of Carolyn's interest, uh, she would only want it to go to a preeminent scientist. She would want that person to be an exemplary citizen. And uh, we felt that she would, she would definitely want the preeminent science, but she'd love it if it was a woman. And however, the lawyers told us we can't say that. So <laughs> you can't have an endowed chair for any group of people that excludes other groups of people. So for future deans, the indenture will just say that she was committed to women. But, um, it can't say that it's only for women. So education, uh, just bring you up to date in one slide. Um, in spite of everything you read about medicine, it's still considered a great profession. <laughs> and the number of people who want to become physicians goes up every year. The number of applicants goes up every year. The number of emails I get asking why I haven't been interviewed goes up every year. <laughs> Um, and so this year we had 4,700 applicants filling out the primary and secondary applications for 104 positions, and that's the highest it's ever been. Um, and uh, I'm sure the class, we're almost done with the process, I'm sure it'll be a great class because every class has been great. The Teaching and Learning Center, we started a number of years ago. The university now has a Teaching and Learning Center, but frankly, it, it's nothing compared to ours because ours is just for one school. Um, and it continues to evolve and to get better uh, with staff that are really knowledgeable about teaching and assessment. It's provided a home for those interested in education. And now there's scholarship programs in medical education. Uh, one of the big issues for students is financial aid and uh, the incomes for the next generation is probably not going to be what it's been in the past. And uh, yet the debt is going up. And we've tried very hard to keep the debt from going up. And the debt from our graduating students is much lower than the national average. But it's still too high. The, uh, about 70% of our students graduate with debt, and the average debt's about 120,000. The average debt in the country is approaching 200,000. And, uh, and because there's a number of schools with 
old endowments that are down at 120,000. There's also a number of schools that don't have the large endowments that are up at 300,000. So that, that 200,000 mean is, is uh, deceiving. But you know, the fact of the matter is 120,000 is still too much debt. And I can tell you students care a lot about that when they're selecting a school. And I can tell you our peers are the, all the schools that have old endowments. And, and so even though we're proud to be down at 120, all our peers are down at 120 or lower. So this year we evaluated, I've uh, had a committee look at that. And the bottom line is we decided to increase our financial aid. And um, so, so we're actually going to put $1.7 million more into financial aid for students than the uh, endowment, uh, the scholarship endowment provides. So, so we're going to use unrestricted dollars. And I think this is a good use of our funds. The last thing I'll just talk about is the online PA program. So some of you may have known Linda Lorimer when she was the secretary of Yale University. Um, she was very committed to developing online education at Yale. The, um, we, we had online lectures, we had online courses, we even had <coughs> online certificates, but we didn't have any online degree programs. And uh, we're probably behind most of our peer institutions in online education. And so she actually visited with all the different deans to find out if, if there's any ways that we could have an online degree program. And what re came to be was this uh, consensus that um, the uh, PA program would actually be an ideal thing to have an online program for because there's a real shortage of healthcare providers. I don't think we're going to meet that shortage with the MD degree because it's, it's just way too expensive to uh, educate an MD. And uh, actually, as medical schools grow, it doesn't matter because they're not increasing the number of residency slots. So uh, we're, we're really not getting more doctors out there. Uh, so we think PA program is the way to go. The advantage of an online PA education is it makes it affordable because people don't have to leave home. Um, and they're more likely to stay in the place from which they where they live. You know, if they live in the Midwest and then they come to Yale, the odds are there's a good chance they'll never go back to uh, rural America, wherever they came from. So, so this program is just launching now. It took a number of years. We had a lot of hurdles to get through. Um, but we've got 44 students from 11 states. And the idea is this is a high quality, interactive online education. They will come to New Haven twice for about a month each to uh, take certain courses that have to be done here. They're going to do their clinical training sites in their local area. We're partnering with a company called 2U, which is Linda actually shopped around. It's very high quality. They do a lot of these degree programs, not in PA, but in other areas with top schools. And they deliver a high quality product. Um, we have the final say on everything. Our faculty uh, approve admissions. We approve the clinical sites. We approve everything in the <laughs> curriculum. They, uh, th this program's going to lose money for a number of years. And uh, um, 2U is paying all that. So um, it, it, sh it should be fine. It should be good. I don't think it's ever going to be a big money maker for Yale. Lots of schools use master's programs or two-year programs to make money. Um, I, I'll be thrilled if it breaks even, but uh, um, I think it's a good thing. So the clinical practice, the, uh, um, this is the growth of the clinical faculty. These are the faculty that are, uh, have, are part of Yale Medicine and a credential, and you see it just keeps going up. And you know, maybe there's the beginnings of a plateau here. Everybody keeps asking me, well, you know, when's it going to plateau because there's not unlimited patients in Connecticut. We're still way below seeing the number of patients that would like to see a Yale doctor. And every time we hire a new doctor, they're full, and it takes months to get to see them. So um, it's just a question of, getting the best doctors, getting good business plans, and we seem to always fill the slots. So um, 
those of you who spend lots of times in meetings at the hospital have sat in the Bishop Conference Room. And uh, so this is Dr. Bishop, uh, for whom the Bishop Conference Room is named. And uh, Dr. Bishop was one of the grand old doctors of Yale New Haven Hospital. And you see this picture of him looking at the patient and listening to them, pencil in hand, or pen in hand. And uh, this was the medicine we all looked forward to practicing. And uh, this is what my uh, uh, artists have, graphic artists have done to this portrait. And so. <laughs> <laughs> This is what Dr. Bishop would be doing today. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and, and so this is a real sore point uh, with a lot of our faculty. And you know, we considered the rollout of EPIC to be one of our major accomplishments. We were um, thrilled that we could do it. And, and we've probably done it as well as anyone else. And I was probably standing here a number of years ago telling you that you're going to hate Epic for the first few years, but after that, you're going to love it. And I was 50% right. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> uh, so as, as I think you know, the physicians hated it for the first two years, and they still hate it, and they're going to hate it forever. The, uh, the, there are certain, I think it does improve patient care, but um, it's, uh, it, it's not good for physicians, for lifestyle, having to enter the data. And so, so we're, we're trying to do uh, a number of th initiatives in Yale Medicine, and one of them is to try to make EPIC more compatible with the physician's uh, lifestyle. So we talk about it uh, at Lisa Stump, uh, who's the head of the EPIC program, came up with this expression, less time typing and more time caring, and what can we do to do that? And, and, and so we've come up with a number of things that we can do. So mobile heartbeat is a way for the physicians to communicate with each other by cell phone without violating HIPAA. Voice recognition technology, obviously, so you can dictate a note. Tap and go, so you don't have to log in every time you go to a new terminal. You just put your ID on it, then you're logged in. Um, Virtual scribe is very interesting. This is somebody sitting thousands of miles away who listens into your interview and actually will type a note for you. So, so as you might imagine, it's expensive, but it can pay for itself if you see more patients by being more efficient. And uh, so, so it, it's undergoing trials right now. And then the Connecticut Prescription Monitoring Program uh, as you know, if you're prescribing a controlled substance, you have to uh, do, go online and report it to Connecticut. Uh, you used to have to log out of Epic, log into their system, and we worked out a way so that Epic now communicates so you can do it in Epic. So these are all little ways to make the lives of the physicians better while they're uh, practicing great medicine. So. Then we're trying to get more efficient. So I, I can tell you uh, the, we're negotiating great contracts with our um, insurance companies, our commercial payers, but it's not enough because Medicare is not going to go up at the rate of inflation and Medicaid's going down. And, and when you add it all together, so we negotiated, most of our contracts go up by three to four percent, but due to our payer mix, the average payment we're going to get this year is only going up by 1.6%. Whereas you know our union contracts, and they're not 1.6%. So um, we need to just keep getting more and more efficient. And, and we need to make sure we're doing the right coding. We, ne we need to make sure that um, in addition to being efficient with patient access, that just for quality, we, we want patients who want to come to Yale to make it easy. Right now, most people will tell you it's pretty difficult to get to see a doctor at Yale. And so we want to centralize everything. So there's standard, they call one number, and they can get in to see a Yale doctor. And, and nobody should have to wait months for that appointment, certainly if they have a really critical, you know, if somebody's been diagnosed that they have cancer, 
they, and they call up here and they're told the first appointment is in two months, that's just not going to be acceptable. And it's not good care from our point of view, and, and that we're certainly inviting them to go somewhere else. So we're going to try to centralize all this. I completely get the positives and negatives of centralization. Centralization is theoretically always good. In practice, it's sometimes good and it's sometimes bad if you do it badly and because you lose control of the people who are doing these things. And so uh, the chairs are all involved in um, uh, driving this process and defining how we're going to do it and we need to be responsive, but I think we do need to do it. Quality and safety are really critical, and so we have a joint committee with the health system, Yale Medicine and the health system, and we're in the late stages of recruiting a uh, chief quality officer who will be the chief quality officer for Yale New Haven Health System and Yale Medicine. Uh, other program improvements that are going on, clinical optimization, we have a team that visits each clinic uh, and really tries to optimize their workflows. We have telehealth programs and virtual secondary opinion programs and a continued strategy for growth and the expansion of our ambulatory practice. And so I was sent this uh, quote by someone who was talking about where is healthcare going and, and what's the best way to get there. And they paraphrased this uh, quote from Alice in Wonderland if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. <laughs> and I think that characterizes where healthcare is today. I don't think anybody knows where it's going, and everybody is doing things. But the, the one common theme is everybody's trying to get bigger. And so this just shows, uh, it's a pretty amazing chart, but every one of those blue dots is a place where there's a Yale medicine doctor. So research, um, the great news for those of you who have been at Yale for years, you know, the university has typically been uh, the number one school in the country in the humanities and in the arts. And, you know, and we're competitive in the sciences, but not, I don't think anybody would say that Yale University as a whole is, stands out above Princeton, MIT, Stanford in the sciences. And, um, the, and, you know, the one exception where we are competitive is the top schools, the biomedical sciences, and that's because of the medical school. And, and the university understands that, actually. And so they, on their own, with no prompting from me, have decided uh, that the future of Yale University rests in improving their STEM programs. That, uh, and, you know, I can tell you, Rick Levin actually uh, had a committee in 1998 and the two priorities were uh, the internationalization of Yale and uh, improving science. And he made the point that they're related because uh, from the international point of view, the only currency is science. The, uh, that people in Asia who are trying to decide where to go to school, they don't really care how good our English department is or, or how good our history department is. They're gonna come here for science, engineering, math, um, and uh, so, so uh, Peter Salovey, Ben Pollock, had really on their own came up with this, and I, I think this is good for us. And I will say they not only want to increase science, but they see the easiest win for Yale in the biomedical sciences, and they say because of the medical school. So they appointed this University Science Strategy Committee, uh, the provost did, and um, there's been a lot of confusion about what this committee is because we're going into a fundraising campaign for the university and everyone is really thinking that this committee is gonna decide the fundraising priority. So I've, the committee will sometimes send an email to a faculty member and say, could you send us a summary of your program? And I get an email, you know, they're already ready to spend $100 million because they think that being asked to submit a proposal is going to make it, a, is basically a guarantee that a donor is going to give them a lot of money. This committee is not a campaign committee. So they're going to come up with priorities that then the university and each of the schools are going to come up with fundraising priorities. Obviously, we'll draw off the university's priorities, but they're not necessarily going to be the same. 
And the example I use is if this committee were to decide that cancer is not a priority, it'll still be a priority for us. If they would decide that mental health is not a priority, I can assure you mental health will be a priority. Um, so the, uh, so, so uh, you don't, don't need to be paranoid about the report the committee comes out with. But this is the committee, and there's four administrators on there and eight faculty, and interestingly, of the eight faculty, four are from the medical school. So, so this really is a statement about what Yale thinks is uh, critical. And they, they are working really hard um, on this. So, I, so once again, I just make the point, no element of medicine is unimportant. I, as dean, am not ever going to look a patient in the eyes and say, I have decided that your disease is not important. Um, so everybody's disease is important. And, you know, that's the way we are. We, we, every physician, every division, every department is interested in the uh, diseases that the patients they take care of have. And we want to do everything to support them. So this, we just got the latest numbers from the famous Blue Ridge Institute, uh, which you'll remember. Um, the NIH used to publish these numbers. This is the total NIH grants for each institution. The NIH stopped uh, publishing these numbers because they felt it encouraged bad behavior. Um, it caused deans to stand up and show slides like this. The, uh, <laughs> Um, so, so what they do is they still, it's still public information, it goes up on their website, each grant, but they no longer add it up for you. So the Blue Ridge Institute is a guy who has a computer in his basement and knows how to add. And uh, he, he sits and adds up the data. And he takes it very seriously. He actually contacts us because he has to categorize the grants. And sometimes they're in the wrong categories. Um, uh, but anyway, you, you can see the, the point I would make is that uh, the key thing is, is that this was the year of sequestration where the NIH grants went down, they stayed low, and then they shot up. Yale did really well this first year and, and we're continuing to do well. Um, and uh, the key thing uh, here that's allowed the uh, our grants to go up and our peer institutions is that the government accepted the fact that they are free to spend money they don't have and to give it to the NIH. And, and so um, it, this, this is, I, I don't know if it's wise economically, I'm not an economist, but it's good for the NIH <laughs> and it's good for research. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the programs, but the one I want to make sure everybody knows about in January, we launched the Center for Biomedical Data Science. This is computational biology. It spans all the way from basic biologic research to clinical investigation. Um, we want faculty from all departments. Anyone who wants to be involved in this, you, you should just, uh, I think there's a website. Uh, let them know. and It's very inclusive, but they, they want people involved who will actually be involved. So that's the only thing they ask. But it'll be a hub for educational activities. It'll provide uh, a definition of infrastructure needs for the community. And uh, this is the initial steering committee. Eventually, it may be a department. Um, we just haven't decided and we want it to get going. Um, but so they're wel welcoming requests for membership and um, the, uh, there was a workshop on uh, uh, February 7th, which some of you may have gone to. So three quick slides on finance. Uh, so th th this is total research funding, the blue line, and I showed you the NIH before, but because the NIH is the majority of our funding, it basically parallels that. So this was the year of sequestration. It stayed down. These are the last two years where Yale research grants have gone up. Um, we actually got through this uh, financial problem here because of the green line, which is clinical revenue. And, and you can see the clinical revenue is just soaring. And, uh, and it, it's not just the fact that money comes in, because you have to compare it to expenses. So the key thing is, is in the clinical practice, we actually have positive margins. And so when 
more money comes in, we actually have more positive margin. And that, I'm going to show you in a second, that's very useful. But you can see, whereas here we, we were probably the only school in the country that had more research revenue than clinical revenue, now we're more the norm where the clinical revenue exceeds the research revenue. And that's important as that. So this is a slide. I show you this every year, but in a different format every year. So I'm going to go through two lines here, which is uh, YSM Central, which is the dean's office, and then clinical departments as a whole. And you can extrapolate to what's going on in psychiatry. It's qualitatively similar. Um, so so in, in the center, we uh, collect all the tuition, but we spend about a million more on education than we collect in tuition. Uh, in research, we get all the indirect dollars, and we spend about 57 million more on research than we collect in indirect dollars. Uh, so how do we do that? And the answer is that we, the dean's office gets about 31 and a half million more from the clinical practice than we spend on the clinical practice. And uh, we have, uh, of the Yale endowment, which I'll show you in a second, there's about 46 and a half uh, million dollars uh, that spins off an unrestricted part of the endowment that is controlled in the dean's office. And so these dollars support these dollars. And uh, this year, in 2017, which we closed out, for the first time, uh, there was a surplus of $20 million. We've never had a surplus of more than $10 million. And I actually remember the days when this was in deficit. And I always said, any year that this number is black is a good year. Uh, but lately, it's been more black, so that's good. Clinical departments basically do the same thing. So uh, if you look at their education expenses, it exceeds education revenue by about $10 million. And the education expense we're talking about is your time. So, so when you do effort reporting and you say you spend 20% of your time teaching, that is goes, we account that as an expense for education. And then we take all the tuition that John gets, which is zero, and, uh, <laughs> and, and then it becomes an expense. Um, and then uh, this is, so the departments obviously get the direct dollars on the grants, and then, but they still spend 23 million more on research than they got direct dollars and grants. And so where does that subsidy come from? The <coughs> clinical practice. And so the clinical departments as a whole made 54, uh, had $54 million more of revenue than they spent. And when you add all that up, they had a $21 million surplus. And when you add up all the surpluses, it, it comes to the medical school had a $51 million surplus in 2017. The, um, and you might remember you got a Christmas email from the provost saying that the Yale University had a big surplus this year and it was terrific, but actually the whole surplus is in the medical school. Then uh, actually I got a number of emails saying, is this a threat? Are they going to take our money away? Um, but they, they're not taking our money away, but we'll end up giving it to them in the end. But. Uh, uh, <laughs> Okay, so th this is the medical school's endowment. Um, and so these were the good years, 20% uh, returns, 25% returns, and a perfect exponential curve. Um, those years ended in 2008 with the crash of the market. And uh, we're fighting our way back. But percent, even though this line may look like it has the same slope here, it's a much lower percentage of the endowment. And uh, at least economists tell me that we're never going to see again the routine 20 to 25 percent increases just based on uh, what's happening to the global economy. But we do have a $2.7 billion endowment, which we think is about the fourth largest endowment of any medical school. And it's, there's probably only about 15 universities that have a larger endowment than we do. Um, and as I said, one billion of this sits in the dean's office as unrestricted dollars that we flow into all the programs. That basically replaces the fact that we don't have state money. But uh, some of this is professorships, scholarships, and things like that, which no, none of us can touch, ex except for the purpose it was given for. So I want to spend the rest of the time 
talking about uh, climate and culture, and I've updated you every year at some of the things we're doing as a school in this regard. And, and uh, you know, I know we're, from where you're sitting, you sometimes may wonder if things are happening, and there are a lot of things happening, so I want to uh, update you. So this is the mission statement that we developed 10 years ago uh, as a medical school, and it's pretty much motherhood and apple pie. We educate, we t uh, do research, and we teach, and, and we provide clinical care. Um, the one thing, to be honest, that's really um, had a, a significant impact is this educate and inspire scholars and future leaders. And that actually has led to some specific decisions, specifically not to increase the size of the class because we wanted, we didn't feel we were here to train a lot of doctors, we we're here to train the future scholars and leaders. Um, but um, in conversations with the students, they, they felt, you know, it's really missing something based on everything we're doing. And, uh, and so they pointed out that, you know, we really don't have any mention of fostering a culture of inclusion and respect and no mention of social justice. And they feel that, you know, that is uh, some, two of the things that really define Yale now. So we are actually appointing a committee to uh, modify the mission statement and we'll get broad community uh, acceptance I doubt we'll get community agreement, but uh, um, you know, to, to get these into a new mission statement. So I, uh, last year I appointed a committee to um, define what the values of the medical school should be. You remember we did the Barrett value survey a few years ago and, and asked people what they thought the values were of the medical school. We were surprised to see uh, the, how many faculty had negative values, that thought that the school had negative values. And uh, so we asked them what should the values be. So this, this committee had 10 faculty from across the school, one student, and we asked each member of the committee to get together with 20 of their peers and get input and talk about this. And so th th this is what came out as the six values. And uh, so I'm gonna go through them. So excellence plus, um, so everyone agreed in the initial Barrett Values Survey that excellence has always been a value of Yale. And uh, everyone agreed that it should stay a value of Yale. But there was a feeling that the definition of excellence needed to be broadened, that it wasn't just excellence in education, research, and clinical practice. And it's really excellence in a lot of the things that are under that. So I'm gonna come back to excellence plus. Respect, uh, you know, I think that's an easy one. We all need to respect each other. Collaboration, the, um, everybody have always told me that, you know, Yale is the most collaborative school there is. There's no walls between uh, uh, any departments. And, but what we learned is that there's a, about 30% of the faculty who don't really see it that, all that collaborative and they felt they were isolated, they were on their own. The academic system doesn't promote uh, groups, it promotes individuals, and uh, they, they didn't really feel that if they, if they failed, they felt they were replaceable, and uh, so collaboration is really a key thing. This is probably the number one, well, one, I shouldn't say that because I'm gonna say this about other things, but it was a major thing that uh, that people uh, felt about. I, I have to say, when I discussed this with the chairs, they were all surprised, as I was, to see that as a problem. When I discussed this with the Faculty Advisory Council, they were not surprised. So, so I, th I think it, uh, it's interesting. Autonomy, so autonomy here is seen as the opposite of bureaucracy. They, they wanna know that the institution the dean's office, the hospital administration, is doing everything we can to help faculty express themselves, that we're not um, overly bureaucratic. Unfortunately, this is a bureaucratic world we live in, and there's a lot of uh, things that are placed upon us, but we should at least try to be as unbureaucratic as possible. And then transparency. So I always give this talk to you, and I try to be as transparent as possible about 
what we're doing. And I always thought we were transparent. I think I told you uh, when I was here last year that seven people felt that the medical school was transparent, and I was one of the seven. Um, the, uh, but it turns out what people, when we have conversations, what they really care about, it, it, they're not concerned that we, whether we tell them what we've decided to do. What they were concerned about was the decision-making processes, that there was a small group of people making decisions, largely the dean and the chairs, and that everybody else was suffering the consequences of those decisions, and they felt they had no input into those decisions. So, so they really want a transparent decision-making process. Now, for the last thing, I, I just want to say, since I'm sure you're a psychiatrist and psychologist, you know the Maslow scale of needs. And um, so, so this is a scale, I'll just remind you, it's a pyramid. At the base of the pyramid is survival. And, and then, uh, you know, if you survive, you move up the pyramid to uh, being concerned about how you interact with your peers. And then if you get past that, it's how well is your organization doing. And then if you get past that, the top of the pyramid is making the world a better place. And uh, so it turns out when you look at the values that the uh, faculty were concerned about, they're all level one and level two. It's survival. And the faculty want to survive, and they want to interact with their peers. The, um, the one student on the committee, had, and who spoke to 20 other students, has no concerns about survival. They went straight to level seven, and they want to make the world a better place. That's why Yale exists. So, so my research project for the next few years is going to be to follow Dippy and see when he moves from level seven down to level one <laughs> in his career. <laughs> the, uh, but but it, it was really striking, the contrast in the concerns. So uh, Gary Desir was on this committee, and uh, he uh, came up with a way for us to remember these six values, which is uh, creates. Um, and so there's two E's here for excellence plus, and, and then it's collaboration, respect, autonomy, transparency, and service. Um, and we'll, as I said, we'll come back to excellence plus. So is this, you know, it's great, it's a bunch of words. Is there actually any action going on in this? And there really is, and I, I don't have time to go through it, but you, you, you should be getting quarterly emails from me. The last one was seven pages long. My wife assured me that nobody will read it because it's too long, although I have to tell you there was an error on page five, and I got all these angry emails about it. So obviously somebody read it, and maybe they went straight to page five. But um, there are a bunch of things going on, and so I think the formation of the Faculty Advisory Council has really been a big plus for Yale. Um, so every 30 of you elect a FAC, uh, member and they meet twice a month, once a month without the administration, once a month with the administration. They have brought up issues that frankly weren't on our radar screen. They've also been a way for us to, uh, when we have a difficult decision, I take it to them and say, what would you recommend? And, and it's, it's just a broader input to decision making and uh, I, I think that's been great. I know it's been great for the members on the FAC and I hope they're communicating to the other faculty. And I know that's not uniform, um, but we'll try to get it better. So the detailed faculty, uh, I, I call it, I'm going to change the slide soon, because it says detailed faculty compensation reviews. Um, and it's actually turned into detailed faculty reviews, because it's not just compensation. It started off being done for compensation. But uh, the idea was, you know, frankly, the old budgeting system is the department, we told the department average raise 3%, and, uh, and then uh, if they thought somebody was really good, they gave them a 4% raise. If they thought somebody was bad, they gave them a 2% raise. And um, if somebody was hired at a salary of $30,000 too low, it was never going to get corrected in that system, and it would never be on our radar screen, because all we ever looked at was the raises. So what we realized is that we need to look at the actual salary of each faculty member. 
So we meet with John, we meet with every chair, there's about 10 of us around the table, and we go through every faculty member from the highest salary to the lowest salary. And uh, there's a, a lot of numbers that we have, you know, grant dollars, collections, RVUs, but frankly, quality is not in the numbers. There are no numbers for quality. So the chairs literally describe each faculty member to us. And we have years in rank, and, and so we ask if somebody's been you know, 19 years in rank, there's a discussion, what's going on? Are they happy being 19 years in, in the same rank? Is this a problem? So we have these discussions, it's great. The, um, and, and you know, we'll, we'll identify uh, problems. We'll, we'll, ch we'll go down the list and after we go through 10 faculty, we'll say, well, number seven sounded like they were just as good as the ones above them and below them, but their salary is, is way lower than the people who, uh, um, we're above them, and uh, let me say, in every case, the chairs have been very interested in correcting it, and, and there's been no resistance from the chairs. I think the only difference is there's 10 sets of eyes looking at it instead of one set of eyes looking at it. And, and so it's been great, and uh, the, we finished three years, we're about to go into this. If you want to meet with me in April and May and you can't get on my calendar, you now know why. We go through the entire faculty in April and May. Um, and, and so the first year, we corrected 6.8% of salaries. It was 10.7% of women and 4.4% of men. Um, and the average increase, you can see, is about $10,000. So this isn't an accurate enough thing where you're going to make a $1,000 correction. Um, and you can see the uh, corrections have gone down each year, but we're still making corrections. Some of this is due to a change in the trajectory of the career of a faculty member. Probably some of it is due to the fact that we, didn't, we missed it the year before. And it, it's still not an exact process. I think every year when we do it, we're going to pick up more and more. Um, the, uh, and and, and we, we work, as you can see, we're correcting women's salaries, we're correcting men's salaries. We, don't go, we haven't gone into this to close the gender gap but we are closing the gender gap. We're not taking it to zero. <laughs> the, um, but, uh, the, um, so I, th I think this is a great process. And as I said, as we get more and more I into this, uh, hopefully we'll have made most of the corrections, but we're still going to do this process because it's a really great way to discuss every faculty member at the school. And, and with this has come the transparency compensation letters that you've gotten, which I hope you like. Um, the, so we're being very transparent. We're telling everybody where their salary is compared to the AAMC standards, and we're telling them where their salary is compared to the peers at Yale. Um, and I have to tell you, this is dangerous. The, most of the experts say, don't do this. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, so there's this study that was done of a, an engineering company with 200 employees, and 70% of the engineers believed they were in the top 10% of the company, and one member out of 200 believed they were in the lower 50th percent. Uh, so obviously, no matter what John does, 50% are going to be in the lower 50th percentile, and uh, and so. Um, and, and people are going to be disappointed. So, so we're very nervous. I can tell you there's some chairs who think that this is a bad idea, that we're demoralizing the faculty. I, but I think all in all, nobody wants to go back. Um, so, so, and we are way ahead of the curve, I can tell you. I don't know another school that does this. And I spoke to FAS, and they don't want to do this. The, um, so uh, the other thing we learned related to the climate, when we spoke to researchers, uh, there were two themes that came out over and over and over again. Uh, one was the basic scientists felt that Yale was asking for too much salary support from them, the basic scientists in basic science departments. And uh, that, so we were providing 30% salary support. We did a, a study of our peer institutions, and there was one other school that required 30%, that gave 30%, required 70%. Uh, but all the others did more. Um, and so we actually liked what Stanford did, which is that they uh, provided less support as you got more senior. 
And so what we decided to do, we put in $1.6 million a year to raise the salary support for pre-tenure faculty in the basic sciences to 50%. Now, the other source of unhappiness, which I think you'll relate to in this department, is that the clinical department, the scientists in the clinical department said, well, you always do this stuff for the basic science departments, but you never do anything for us. And, and so the, the problem is the clinical department's so massive compared to the basic science departments. We have no, we don't, con we control how many faculty a basic science department can hire, but we have no controls on uh, how many uh, faculty psychiatry hires. And I can tell you probably half the hires every year are in psychiatry. The, uh, the, uh, and, and so, the qu and we also, the salaries are, are frankly frequently much higher in the uh, um, uh, clinical department. So what we decided to do, we, we really thought about this. Um, we gave 1.6 million to the basic science departments. Let's give 1.6 million to the clinical departments. And, and then we thought, what could we do that was similar? Well, the, the rule was that nobody should, be, nobody should have to provide more than 95% of their salary on uh, grants. That was the existing rule. So we agreed with the clinical chairs that they would not ask anyone to provide more than 75% of their salary on grants. And we calculated how much that would cost. The 1.6 million didn't cover it all, but it covered most of it if we did it for the first 10 years and kept it to the under the cap. Um, and so we did that, and we've given the money to the clinical departments. As you might imagine, getting 1.6 million uh, for each group from the dean's office, nobody complained. Uh, the other source of unhappiness uh, was the confusion around the clinician educator track. And one, one of the negative values that came out of the Barrett Value Survey was mixed messaging. And uh, the, the worst mixed messaging was on the clinician educator track. It was uh, faculty being told to be clinically productive, see as many patients as you can, generate as much revenue as you can. And they would do that, and they'd have and you make your patients happy, provide great care. And they did that, and then after 10 years, they came to their chair and said, I'm ready to be promoted. And the chair looked at their CV and said, you don't have any scholarship. And the clinical faculty saying, you never told me to generate scholarship. And, uh, and so this was a real source of unhappiness. So the question was, should we remove scholarship as a requirement for the clinician educator track? We appointed this committee, and they said, no, do not remove scholarship, that we're very proud of the scholarship that clinician educators have. And I have to tell you, because I chair the senior a &P committee, it's quite impressive, the people who get promoted to professor on the clinician educator track. They really make Yale a more scholarly place by a lot. And so I, I was a big <coughs> fan of not removing that. Uh, and, but they did recommend that we uh, have a more clear definition of the type of what represents scholarship. Uh, but out of that thing came the idea that we do need a track for people who just want to practice clinical medicine and do it really well. And, uh, and so the clinician educator track is a misnomer. I hate the name of it because, number one, it doesn't imply scholarship when, in fact, there is scholarship required. And number two, having the word educator in it implies that all the other tracks should, don't have to be an educator. And that's not true. You need to teach on every track. So, um, the, uh, so I hate the name. Anyway, that is what it is. We had a category uh, called clinical employment, but it wasn't a, for people who wanted to be clinicians, it wasn't a ladder track. Uh, uh, track. Um, and so we're, we're forming. We actually took it to the Yale Corporation in December, and they gave us permission to form another track, which will be the clinical track. It's a ladder track, and you'll be able to be assistant, associate, full professor, and for clinical performance and education. No expectation for scholarship, but I can tell you, I think the bar is going to be quite high on clinical skills for that. So I, I expect the bar for clinical excellence is going to be higher than on the clinician educator track, just as the clin clin clinician educator was higher than the clin clinician scholar. So. Um, 
the, uh, but we're working that out now. But I think this will be good because people don't want to come to Yale and, and know that they're in an employment category and not in a, uh, a, a ladder title. Um, so I think this shows a more of a respect for clinicians. We're also getting rid of the undifferentiated designation for the first six years um, because the problem is we don't know what's happening in the first six years. People in the departments may know, but when people leave here after three or four years, we don't know where they were headed. We don't know why they're leaving. So, so we're going to ask everyone to designate a track when they're hired. But we're going to let people for the first six years switch tracks freely. But I want to know, for instance, if someone's hired on the clinical track and then gets interested in scholarship and shifts to the clinician educator track, I'd like to know that. I'd like to be able to track that as data. I'd like to know when a clinician educator doesn't get any scholarly time and is forced to switch to the clinical track. Right now, I have no way to know that. So, so we're going to do that. And I think when people designate tracks, they'll, we'll, they, we're then going to make sure that they have appropriate mentoring for that track and that they're being provided the infrastructure to succeed on that track. And one of the things why CCI has had a scholars program for people who are eventually going to get NIH grants and things like that, they also had an award now for people to get started as clinician educators. So, so that it wouldn't uh, have the same amount of protected time, but it'd have some protected time for two years to get a clini clinician educator program going. Another thing we're doing uh, right now, we're forming three committees uh, to work on things that we've identified are as important for the culture of the school. And so let me say, changing the culture is an iterative process. I think we've made a lot of progress. But it's the type of thing you do something, see the results. Then you do another thing, see the results. So th these were identified as three areas that were critical in uh, what we're doing. Clinician morale, we, we found when we did the Barrett Valued Surveys, the most unhappy group were the clinicians. Uh, leadership, you can't change climate and culture if you don't have the right leaders and you're not training the right leaders to be the best leaders. And engagement, that the faculty should feel they're engaged, they're an important part of the community, they're valued. It's tough when you have 3,000 faculty. Um, and so we've got chairs for this. So Gary Desir, Walter Longo are doing clinician morale. Linda Mays and David Schatz are doing leadership. And uh, the engagement one will be the most challenging. Um, and that's uh, Eve Colson, Naftali Kaminsky, and Carla Rothlin. And they'll all report up to a steering committee, which I'm going to chair. OK, the last part, which turned out to be a major thing when we did the Barrett Value Survey and we met with the Faculty Advisory Council, and the overwhelming concern uh, was the relationship between the hospital and the medical school. And, um, and so um, I don't I think I have to go through all the history, but in the very bad old days, the relationship was really contentious. And it, it was, um, uh, you know, ba basically the medical school hated the hospital, the hospital hated the medical school is the easiest way to describe it. Fifteen years ago, Martin and I took over and we really decided we were going to change that and we wanted to have a relationship of mutual respect. Um, and what we use the expression was tied at the hip, uh, so that the health system and the medical school were tied at the hip. For us to succeed, they had to succeed. For them to succeed, we had to succeed. It's, it's had a huge effect. That growth of the clinical practice has been fueled by that relationship. Uh, we, we used to get 40 to $50 million a year from the hospital. This year, I heard a number of like $290 million, I think. Uh, so, so it, it's really gone up the amount of money that the hospital's investing in our programs, and frankly, we're delivering. So, so the reason they continue to do that is because we're delivering and their revenue's going up and they have the money to do that. So, so the, if you would have asked me, you know, this is one of the things I've been most proud of uh, during my deanship here, that this great relationship. Well. Then we had this Barrett Value Survey and said, well, we heard from the faculty, well, the relationship's really not that great. And to be honest, 
we knew it, you know, once it was pointed out. I, I think we knew what the relationship was. What we didn't know was how the effect it was having on the faculty who were in the trenches trying to practice in this setting. And, and so uh, Rob Malik, who's our organizational psychologist, met with 20 um, uh, people at the hospital side, 20 people at the medical school side at different levels. And basically, uh, I think I told you this last year, um, he asked them, what do you think of yourselves and what do you think of the other group? And the hospital people basically said, uh, we're fantastic. We know how to run a practice. And they said the faculty are a bunch of spoiled, tenured prima donnas who think they know things that they don't know. And if they just let us run the practice, it'd be great. Then they asked the faculty, what do you think of the hospital? What do you think of yourselves in the hospital? Faculty said, we're great. And uh, we know how to run the practice. And that the hospital people, are, they, they bloated in the number of people. They get bloated salaries. And they don't know what they're doing. If they just let us run the practice, everything would be great. So it was clear this relationship was going nowhere. And, uh, and so we, we realized, uh, Marna and I met with Rob Malik, probably going on now a year and a half. Um, and uh, um, we discussed what we could do. And uh, we realized uh, that we can't be two organizations tied at the hip. We really need to function more as one virtual organization. And so um, it turns out it's a lot easier to do this in PowerPoint than <laughs> it is in reality. To, uh, <laughs> So we are working on this, and, um, and w it was very interesting. We talked about you know, how, uh, what it would mean that we agreed that we all need to be focused on the excellence of, each, of all of our missions. But um, the discussion initially was all focused on patient care, which is important. But, um, and, and so we actually all agreed that excellence uh, does need to be focused on the patient. I'll let you enjoy this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, that, you know, I, I think it, it is all patient centered at a medical school, but it's not just clinical care and, and service to the patients. But it, it, because of our mission to patients, we also want to do the cutting edge research that improves patient care. We want to train the next generation of. Uh, healthcare providers and and all and we want to do all of this with excellence and you know so the hospital on a day-to-day -day basis is more concerned with the fact that people in Connecticut think they're excellent because that's who fills their beds you know for us it's more the whole country the whole world but we all need to own all of that we need to make sure the people in Connecticut want to come here. They also need to own the fact that we need a national and international reputation because none of us are here because we just want to be famous in New Haven. Um, so uh, once again, is this just a set of words or is this real? And, and so there's been real actions. And so I've been sitting on the Yale New Haven Hospital board for over 10 years and, um, and that sent a nice message and I was happy with that. But I can tell you it accomplished nothing because all decisions are made before they come to the board and th there's no contentious arguments that occur uh, in a board meeting. So the, it turns out the health system has an executive cabinet that meets every other week with their leadership. That's when they make all their decisions. That's the only time they all get together to make decisions. So now Paul Tahiri and I are sitting in that meeting. And so we are there. So if they start to coming to a conclusion that we don't agree with, rather than them coming to that conclusion, telling us about it, have us meet and say it's crazy, then we tell them, and then they disagree, and then it comes. Right now, we're in the meeting while it's being cooked. And uh, it, it, it's turned out to be really good. Similarly, uh, the chairs meet on Fridays. And when we met in small groups, we didn't invite the hospital because we wanted the chairs to speak freely. And we realized out of this that, no, we all need to speak freely in the presence of the hospital. So Marna and uh, Rick DeQuilla both are now come to all those chairs meetings. And, uh, and I, I think that is going to change how we do business. It still needs to roll down through the organization. Um, and so uh, 
this is one, Mike Luft is one of their finance people who is now on the Yale Medicine Finance Committee. More importantly, we're having meetings with the senior leadership, Marna and I, and uh, trying to roll down this feeling that we're one. And Marna and I are actually traveling around the health system um, trying to do this. But we're calling this a oneness, a feeling of oneness. And to be honest, there's three parts of this. We need all the departments to feel that there is one within the medical school. We need all the hospitals in the health system to feel they're one. And then together, the two sides need to feel that they're one. And, and this is not easy. But um, So I'm going to finish up. So Darren Lattimore is now here uh, as the deputy dean for uh, diversity and inclusion. He's set up an office. He's taken over the student <laughs> affairs aspects of this. He's dealing with a lot of the searches and teaching unconscious bias training. And um, uh, what uh, Darren will tell you is he maintains an open door policy for all members to discuss issues related to diversity, inclusion, and equity. And I can tell you, I, I still haven't figured out what it is about Darren, but people love to talk to him when they're unhappy. And it turns out they come to him even when it has nothing to do with diversity, inclusion, or equity. So, so I always know when I see someone walk into Darren's office that I'm going to hear about them in the next two days. Uh, and it, it's amazing. Um, also, I wanted to just say we will, on June 1, be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the first women students at the medical school. This will be part of the university celebration in 2019 of the 50th anniversary of the first uh, Yale College undergraduate who, who were women. And so let me finish with, um, as we've gone through and talked about what Excellence Plus means, Rob Malik, our uh, educational psychologist, gave me this quote by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And uh, I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to tell you something about it. But I, I think this really kind of encompasses everything. It, probably different parts of it will um, be, excite different uh, people among you. But uh, so th this is actually called the definition of success. But um, I, we'll call it excellence plus. To laugh much to win respect of intelligent persons and the affections of children, to earn the approbation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to give oneself, to leave the world a little better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to have played and laughed with enthusiasm and sung with exultation, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived this is to have succeeded. And I think this summarizes the many things we would like Yale School of Medicine to be for you and, and for us. But I can't finish without saying, so I give this talk 29 times from January to March. And this is actually, I just checked, this is the halfway mark today. <laughs> the, um, but the second time I gave it was to the Department of Medicine. And Naftali Kaminsky, uh, emailed me and said, if you're going to be giving this 27 more times, you need to know that Ralph Waldo Emerson stole this from Bessie Anderson Stanley. <laughs> so, so Bessie Anderson Stanley was a woman who submitted a poem called The Definition of Success to one of these magazines like a Reader's Digest competition, and she won it. She won first place. And um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, he didn't quite steal it, but he, it's definitely 90% identical to her poem. And, and if you Google her, uh, you'll say, see that she did, she's known for one thing in her life, which was this poem. It's written on her tombstone, and it says that Ralph Waldo Emerson is falsely given credit for this. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'll let you decide what that applies to gender <laughs> issues. Um, anyway, I, I, but I do think this summarizes what I think what you mean by excellence plus. So thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you.